Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks for being here. Thank you. And so, yeah, I'm Harry. Just before I kick off, I actually would like to say thanks to Marina and Moritz for organizing this event. It is fantastic to see everybody here, the entire kids app community in one place, all, all talking about uh, the business in such a casual way. So thank you. Okay, so this is a this is a slide deck with seventy one slides and. Um, I'm going to have to talk very quickly. Uh, not all the slides, but a lot of content. And I put this together for Casual Connect for a games audience some time ago. Um, and then I, after I said that I would do the ABCs, it seemed like a clever idea until I realized I had some 26 slides. I needed to think of something that started with Z to do it mobile and with, uh, with kids' mobile apps. So it's not the full alphabet, and it's somewhat reorganized. Um, but this slide deck probably represents almost everything that I know about kids' apps now. And, um, and, you know, I also, I really believe in, in sharing data, because if I knew now, if I knew then what I knew now, and I might have reconsidered entering the kids' app space at all, because it's a really tough space. So I'm going to share some numbers with you, and uh, share some things that hopefully can help you develop your own plans. Um, my own background is games industry, um, and um, I'm still an active investor in the games industry. But I'm going to show you a little bit about Story Toys and some of the newer products. Touch Look Listen is a preschool case. learning tool for tablets and mobile phones that will delight and encourage young children as they learn their first words. So it's the perfect app for parents and little ones books. to share, combining superb and photographs, simple based, and friendly narration. It's also a innovative way to learn a second for language. For older Touch Look Listen is just like a real book. Each page is introduced by a playful yeah. rhyme, while we bright have different and colorful images magically pop up in a 3D scene. when. This one. Little ones will love singing and playing along with an awesome Sorry, animal band app, a super yeah, cute music toy scary. for tablets and mobile phones. The animal band are in the mood for dancing, so kids can but play, they feel uh, like sleeping. They can make up Wake them up, and they'll and, uh, soon be rocking and rolling. Fun and easy to use. The app encourages even very young children to explore music while listening to their. So on my slides. Uh, obviously, it's the ABC, so I do have to start with A, and uh, our market is really about three, about three uh, platforms. It's about Apple, Amazon, and, uh, and Android. Uh, and together, they're the mobile market. And um, we're moving up to P, and I, I could have chosen parents or pricing, or even personally identifiable information for this, but I like pizza, so it makes for a good numbers chart. And um, around about casual next time, I sat down with the guys in, uh, in Super Data Research, and, and I asked them to estimate what size they thought the kids app market was. Now this isn't the kids category. This is all apps designed for children under 13, so across games, across education, across, um, across the kids space. And they reckoned it was worth $1.7 billion. I'm still trying to figure out where the other $1.5 billion is, but they think it's a $1.7 billion market, which is a significant opportunity for us. Um, but as I said, that's everything designed for the, uh, for the under 13 audience. Two, to move on to the, the split across the platforms, and uh, we saw some interesting, uh, interesting numbers from Dr. Panda, and it's pretty much aligned with our own. We see that uh, Apple represents about 76% of our revenues on a, uh, on a, I think this was, yeah, this was the six months ending uh, the 31st of January. Uh, Google Play about 15%, and Amazon about 9%. But, um, but there's some interesting nuances in that as well. For example, if I look at our Chuggington app, which is a licensed IP, um, you'll see that Amazon actually represents a much bigger portion of that pie. Google's around the same, and Apple, Apple is less. And that's not because it performs less on Apple, it's because um, Amazon are particularly effective at merchandising branded products. So we are able to leverage their cross-promotion function and get a much better sales number and then disproportionate to our own, our own internal IP. So I put P in, in place of B, and now I'm going to move on to C. And I just want to know, who hasn't, who doesn't know what Kobe is here? OK, so there's, there's a few people. It's worth, um, it's worth noting. I could have used uh, Common Core for C as well, but, um, but Kobe is something that's really, really important. And I put this together, as I said, for a games audience, but the games audience uh, were not necessarily familiar with Kobe. Um, so I have a COPA 101 deck, but COPA is nothing to do with monetization. It's a Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, and it really deals with how you communicate with children, how you capture information relating to children, how you acquire parental consent, and how you market to and track children. 
And COVID is especially relevant in the kids' market because everything that you do has to be COVID compliant um, if you want to work well in the US. So if you want, and I'm sure the, this deck will be live later, so you can have a look at the talk that I gave on COPA. There's a little bitly link to it there. But one of the things that COPA did, and I, I, I don't know if this was the, the reason that we saw the kids' category come into existence, um, but many people do associate it for the timing i.e. COPA rules changed in July, the kids' category went live in September, and the kids' category was a, um, was a transformative event for the children's entertainment industry. I think probably without the kids' category, I don't know, would, would, this, would this event have happened? Um, it's been a significant event for us. And, um, you know, people are familiar with it, it's, it's, it's the, the app store for kids. But without it, as I said, we wouldn't be here. To give you an impact, an idea of the impact that the kids category kind of had for us, it, uh, it would have accelerated our downloads by a factor of two to three times, which is pretty significant. So you can see our numbers there. You know, I won't uh, go into the details on them, but you can see in August we were doing much less than we, we've been doing since then. So the kids category kind of really brought out a significant change for us. Um, and I think there was another another word that began to be, which is validation. It certainly validated our business plan and validated the market for us and it also helped with our venture capitalists because certainly I think in terms of building a business based on an original IP, it's not that hard to develop an app and get it off the market but to develop that portfolio of apps offer you to take risks that you mightn't be able to do out of cash flows. We are venture backed. In the kids category we also deal with the ranges and I won't talk about this for a little while because it does impact marketing. And as people know, there's a, there's a, a, a category for apps under, for under fives, so six to eights, and nine to eleven. So we had actually looked at this before in terms of where we target our apps. And we looked at the children's audience micro segmentation, particularly in terms of content selection. And what we see is that uh, from, the, you know, in the, from the ages of, let's say, two to four, parents prescribe what content the child consumes. And from the ages of you know, about four to seven or eight, although Nine, it seems in some markets, there's parent-child consensus on what content is consumed. And once you hit eight years old, nine years old, children start to hear about content in the playground. And that's a much more expensive market to market to. I'm sure much and monsters are very, very familiar with that. Um, so I think it's also one of the reasons why you see a lot of content that targets the preschool age, i.e. you're talking to parents. Um, parents see the appeal in your content and put it in front of their children. It becomes trickier as time goes up. I think there's actually really good opportunities to target the, those older age groups, those seven to nine year old. I think there's actually much less content on the various app stores uh, than there is, for example, the two to four years old. And, and this is pretty important from a marketing message as well. But again, to deal with some of the other uh, pieces around about uh, the kids category, people are familiar with gating. I, I'm not going to talk about that, but basically this is how we how we address some of the COPA requirements and also some of the app store, um, various app store requirements of uh, not exposing children to marketing messages and not uh, preventing accidental purchases. So we have a gate that's a, a two finger swipe. Now to the first kind of meaty part of this presentation. And, um, and I want to talk a little bit about user acquisition because it is really, really hard in the COPA zone. Um, because particularly parents buy and children consume, but, but separately, there are all sorts of restrictions around marketing, around in-app purchases that make it quite difficult to acquire users. I'm going to talk a little bit about the various different mechanics for acquiring users. Um, organic being the, uh, being the obvious one. And uh, really, you know, the opportunity for organic discovery is, uh, is quite rare and uh, it's, it can be a little bit limited now, um, particularly for the, the paid app space. Uh, one of the reasons that we did enter into the licensed IP space with apps like Chuggington and Very Hungry Caterpillar was there's a much higher incidence of organic acquisition, i.e. these brands show up in parents' searches for things that their children were interested in. So if you have an app that's associated with a television program or a film or a famous book such as uh, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, you will rank organically much higher than you would than uh, if you were you know, just our, uh, your, your regular app. Also, one of the reasons we started out making apps based on the grim scary tales. Um, and of course, the biggest thing that can drive um, organic acquisition is, uh, you know, is featuring. And, um, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't say anything about featuring other than make a great app that can, you know, really show the power of the device and really create some magic or wow factor for parents and children that they can, that they can share. Um, 
it is the most effective eBay out there for the paid app maker. And um, you know, quality is a, big, is a big factor in that. There are lots of places you can go to for validation of your apps in terms of quality. Um, you know, children's technology review being, being one of the major ones. Moving on to another piece of uh, user acquisition, and this is like the type of marketing, but uh, mommy bloggers. Um, we've actually found that, um, that the, the audience online of um, mod bloggers uh, can actually be very, very effective. Some of them can be extremely effective in terms of user acquisition, others not so much. And what I would say is if you're looking at this route, steer clear of the ones that say, okay, we're well, going to charge you $100 for your review. Because clearly those blogs are the ones that aren't making up the advertising revenue to sustain themselves. The fair blogs are the ones that, um, that I think are, you know, they're accepting a promo code, disclosing the promo code, reviewing your app for free, I'm getting you out there. Um, and then on to, I guess I'm going to touch on cross-promotion twice, but uh, this is my clever X. Um, but cross-promotion, we, we used to do cross-promotion like this. Um, it was very, very intrusive. Literally, when the app returned from a, from a background event, our cross-promotion screen would show up. And it was very, very, I guess it was quite in your face in terms of how it was pushing, uh, pushing our marketing. So it was quite effective in acquiring new users and sales, but, um, but we decided to abandon it for something more subtle and um, something much more content integrated. So this is how we do it now. We have in all of our, in all of our book apps, this is one of our classic apps, and we have a, um, a little pop-up from the bottom of the screen that just shows a bookshelf. And it's great because it's content integrated and it's functional. Anything that has a tick mark on it uh, is a, something that you have. So you can launch that app from it. If you don't have a tick mark, it encourages collectability. Uh, and of course, this is all gated, so parents can't just, or children can't just click on it. They can click on anything that they own and it will launch, but if they try to buy something, it requires uh, the parent gate to be accessed. So we found this to be very effective, and I'm going to swap some numbers in a little while. I also want to talk about what I would call the dark side of user acquisition, uh, particularly uh, hustlers. And um, I'm sure anybody in the app space gets emails like this. I can't see it on my screen here yet. So uh, this is the, and they're incessant. Um, 20 for the discount off packages for, for whatever. This is somebody offering us, I think, um, yeah, uh, advertising. These ones are the ones that are, are really particularly insidious, um, which are paid reviews, right? And this is one that just came in yesterday. 100 ratings on Google Plus, um, you know, what is it, like $35, 100 reviews, $100. This is actually skewing the app market and the reviews market quite badly, and it ties into something else I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. But, um, um, so you can see buying users, uh, very, very common. There's a distinction between what I would say is uh, good, paid, good paid user acquisition and then the sort of scammy paid user acquisition which we don't like, which is buying rankings, buying users, and buying charts. And really, at the nasty end of the market, we have uh, something called bots. Hey, who, 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 everybody familiar with, with, with bots? Anybody? Hands up. A few people, right? I, I like to call it the dark underbelly of paid user acquisition. Uh, there was a huge crackdown on it last year. These are fake app store accounts that are downloading free apps to boost, to boost rankings. Uh, there was a huge crackdown last year, but they're not gone away. What we're seeing now is that bots are still being used for install, but also there's the rating bots, particularly prevalent on the Google platform. We we'll often find that uh, some of our traffic has fallen into bot hands. We're getting garbage reviews, or we're getting a review that says this app is great and, five, and, and one star, and this app is terrible and five stars. So we see a lot of this, and it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 just don't go there. It's, it's a nasty side of UA. Your best opportunity for UA is really yourselves. Build your community, build your users, and then build your audience, which we'll talk about in a second. On to the commercial side of, uh, you know, of, of, of app development. Well, this has come up before, but in-application purchases. Uh, we're, we're big fans of IAPs. And we're not fans of, uh, of this. This is, I think it's a game off game or Ubisoft. It's, it, this was the Might of the Pony game, which they claimed was aimed at, uh, at what do they call them, uh, heritage fans of Might of the Pony. So therefore, they felt uh, that it was perfectly justifiable to offer a $99 pack of coins and note that it costs real money down the bottom of the screen. Um, which is just, I mean, it's, 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 it's disgraceful behavior and it led to things like this. Always the name online, but these kind of $600 bills. Thankfully, a lot of this has fallen away. There's still opportunity for IAPs, but I don't think you're going to see those tax dollar bills. It's going to be more like that, more like loose change. Um, but still, it converts well to us. And I'm going to talk about conversion now. 
So we, um, we were always just paid apps. We didn't do anything free. We didn't have any add-ons. Last year we introduced, um, uh, I don't know a demo, but we introduced uh, puzzles and, uh, and pop-up sticker books into our apps. And uh, we, we've seen great results from that. So you know, this is not, each one of these isn't an IAP. Uh, we have, um, you can unlock all of the puzzles, I think it's for $1.99. And over the first quarter of this year, we had a 13 to 17% conversion rate on those, which is super high. I mean, if you talk to anybody in the games industry, you tell them you've got a 17% conversion rate on their, you know, on, on your application purchases, they just say, they just won't believe you. Now, one of the reasons for that is, this is a, I hate the word, but this is a premium um, app. So, this is converting to a user that's already bought your product. So, you have an endorsement already, the user bought it and they like it and they are buying additional functionality, and we have a very, very low complaint rate. It's like point, you know, zero one percent of all of our downloads result in, you know, result in refunds as a result of this. So, incremental, discrete functionality, unlocking something that will then always be available to the user to play is a good thing. Similarly with Animal Band, Animal Band is a paid application. Uh, we're doing some free experiments at the moment, but generally it's a paid application. I think it's $1.99, and then there's additional song packs in it. And we find that 28% of users will buy one or more additional sound packs, which is again, it's a tremendous conversion, tremendous conversion rate. Um, and then I think, you know, this is the first time that we really went free, was with, uh, we've done some simple free apps and free trials, but with Chuggington. And I want to talk to you about this, because this is a free app, and talk about the conversion rate on free apps. Chuggington for us was pretty interesting, because it generates, the free application generates huge volumes. And it converts like this. So about 1.68% of, uh, of Google Play users convert the paid version. The Apple App Store about 3.46. And on Amazon, 4.65. Again, in line with the brand. So, you know, but the interesting thing that we see with this is that um, we actually make probably about as much money from the free version as we do from the paid version now. So that gets us thinking about how, what other free things should we be doing. I suppose then back to the cross promo, what we're delivering with this. Um, well, it's pretty impressive. More than 40% of all of our sales come from this cross promo uh, toolbar, which is just incredible. And uh, I think it's because it's content integrated, it's gated, these are not accidental purchases. Not only that, more than 10% of every play session results in the store kit, i.e. The, the, the people passing the gate and looking to buy another app, which is incredible. And I would say to everybody here, and I think I'm echoing uh, Thomas's comments, the most powerful marketing tool for your next app is every app you've sold before. Take a portfolio approach to what you're doing and really try to capture those customers and keep them in. Uh, I, um, I've only got four minutes left, so I've got everything else there. I'm on slide 52, so we're okay. I couldn't find a kitchen sink, so I used a bath. Analytics, you won't be able to refine your cross-promotion tools. Um, unless you have a decent analytics platform. And, and you know, Flurry is great, but it is limited. You should look at how you develop your own backend so that you can determine on a real-time basis almost how your apps are being received, what sort of sales you're doing, what your proportion is, and it'll help to determine how you develop in the future. And this is like a chart that I would pack together that would, would inform me about, um, about that 10% number. So you can see how many users were using that app on a daily basis and the trend line for how many were clicking to buy other apps. So this is really, really important information. On Skin Pass, this, this is an international community here. This, it's great to see a multicultural and um, multinational development community. But you know that uh, localization, either make a language free so it's appealing everywhere or target your markets. Um, this is animal balance. We do everything, so only non-localized products. Um, English territories represent 90% of the sales because it's really expensive for us to develop a song uh, for that product. So we just did it in English and we're quite happy with that. But in our multilingual territories, you see that we have a much broader, uh, much broader spread of sales. What's pretty interesting here is, is our market size in Germany, or market in Germany relative to everywhere else. And that is because of our, we started out with Grimm's Scary Tales. And the Grimm's established us very, very well in this market quite, quite early on. I couldn't think of anything that started with Y, so Emmett suggested a picture of Yak. So there's a picture of Yak. And here's my Z. I thought this was particularly clever. Piracy is a huge industry in the paid, or it's a huge problem in the paid apps industry. If you type story toys into your browser, a clean browser, the first result that comes up is APK. Where do we find story toys content for free? And um, it's, it's difficult. And I, I won't go through the numbers, it has changed, but at one point we were running 
greater than 70% piracy rates on our apps, because we can track, our metrics tell us every install, and all we need to do is track that against our sales events, and, and it's, a, it's a huge problem. I don't know if there's anything we can do about it. We like to pat ourselves on the back and say, hey, it's a sign we've got a really good brand, but uh, that's another thing that would help anybody decide whether you should go free or not. I think free is one of those areas where piracy becomes less of a problem. So you can see, uh, yeah, so this is just, and it's not just, I mean, it's, it's, it's Android, it's, um, it's Apple, it's everywhere. So that's Story Toys. Um, I have about one minute and uh, five seconds left. So some general comments on the market. Um, it's, it's a tricky one. I think we'll be talking about this in the panel at the end of the day. We do track our performance against competitors. And this is a market that was vastly improved by the introduction of the kids category. I, I can tell you honestly, uh, around about July last year, I was there, you know, is, is there anything in this? Is there anything in this business? Should we continue in this business? And the kids category changed that for us. But you know, we saw earlier really on the percentage of the top 50 of the kids category that's dominated by large, um, by large um, media companies. And, you know, then we also have you know, literally tens of thousands of kids apps that are generating you know, beer money, maybe $50 a month. And we're kind of being squeezed in the middle. When we got into this space, we thought, okay, look, how do we, I mean, I, I sold my last business, set up this one, we thought that in a few years we would, um, be attracted potentially to a publishing house buy, or you know, particularly a publishing house, because we were working in the book space at that time. So, you know, um, this is this is my K, by the way, it's my second K, but this is a curve. Um, does anybody know what this one what this one is? That people, have people heard of Kumar Ross? It's the it's the, the cycle of um, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And you know, back in 2010, I really did look at the publishing industry. I looked at how similar they were to the, uh, to the music industry in, in 1998, 1999. And you know, you see a change agents. And I thought the publishing industry was on this Google Ross curve, just somewhere between denial and anger. So I thought, well, it's going to take about four years before they're in this, uh, this acceptance phase and start acquiring companies. Um, so in 2014, I, well, you know, I think we're probably still somewhere just between denial and anger. I don't think they've moved on. <laughs> that much. Um, but you know, the publishing industry moves slow, so we can give them time. I think we are seeing very, very interesting things. I mean, we look at Thomas, it's, it's not to insult the publishing industry, but, but the toy industry is, is definitely adopting mobile in a very, very big way, as is other children's media like film and, uh, and television. So I actually do think that we will start to see, I've said this every year for the last few years, I think we'll see a shakeout um, beginning this year. I, we are seeing competitors, friends, uh, you know, co I mean, it's not big enough market for competitors. There, there will be, I think, no billion dollar companies in this space. We should all get together and share information like this and try to help when we see our friends floundering or, or, or starting to fail. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot of that this, this year. And, um, you know, I, I just hope that we can, we can all stay in the game and uh, build a great business for ourselves. So that is, yeah, that's my children's and TV. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. I've run over my time by, I think, a minute and a half, but... Um...